today we've invited three of the participants who pitched at the 2019 Health Tech Challenge to share their story and journey with us. Our panelists are uh, Professor Ray D'Agostin, Dr. Philippa Caroli, and Mr. Edward Bias. Let me start by asking each of you to just introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Can we start with you, uh, Raymond? Sure. Uh, my name is Ray D'Agostin. Um, as you can see, my accent's not from Melbourne. Uh, I moved here 20 years ago for a two-year job. Uh, it's worked out pretty well. I'm a professor and deputy head of chemical engineering. Uh, I finished my oh, PhD at Carnegie Mellon University and my undergrad at the University of Delaware long enough ago that I don't really need to give the years. Um, uh, and and I, I work in areas of interfacial phenomena uh, and particle technology. And so that's really I'm always interested in how maybe drops, bubbles, or particles interact on a very fundamental level. And uh, we study that by using a lot of different tools in nanotechnology, and we often build our own experimental and theoretical measurement tools to be able to study these, these small interactions of, say, nanoparticles. Uh, and then we translate that a lot into applications where um, we might be trying to make a greener personal care product or a more sustainable processed food where we're really looking at engineering the formulations and additives in these complex mixtures to, um, and to do that where we're really concerned about the synergistic interactions between nanoparticles and additives and surfactants and, and polymers. Uh, and so that's led us down the, the, you can imagine though those, those challenges about synergy and nanoscale interactions also do translate over into, into life sciences. And sometimes we're lucky enough to use the techniques we've developed and work in, uh, in the life sciences area collaboratively as well. Thanks, Raymond. Um, Pip, over to you. Tell us a bit about yourself, please. Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Pip Caroli. I'm a senior researcher in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at, at the University of Melbourne. And I also finished my PhD there a um, couple of years ago. And my PhD was looking at the causes and patterns of epileptic seizures. And now my, my research and work is very much focused on translating um, that science into uh, solutions for people with epilepsy. And, and to that end, I work very closely with um, the Australian startup company, Sia Medical. Uh, so I've been working there SIA started about three years ago now, slightly over. And so I've been working there from the start as a mobile app developer and, and data scientist to translate some of the research insights into tools for people. Thanks, Pip. Edward. Thanks, Lewin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name's Edward. I'm a biomedical engineer um, and also a co-founder and the CEO of Ventura Medical. Um, a little bit about me. Our first sort of began to develop a passion for healthcare, engineering and science um, in high school. Um, and it was actually after hearing from a motivational speaker uh, by the name of Sam Cawthorn. So in 2006, Sam was involved in a major car accident, uh, which actually left him with an amputated right arm and permanent disability in his right leg. And he shared with us some of the challenges that had come as a result of his life-changing accident. Gave thanks to the many clinicians, doctors and healthcare professionals who not only saved his life, but who had sort of worked tirelessly to develop devices, kind of like his prosthetic arm, which had really given him his life back. Um, and so as I listened to Sam's story, I was inspired to work towards being able to help others in the same way, to develop devices which saved lives and gave people their lives back. And to help me achieve this, I completed both my Bachelor of Science and Master of Engineering degrees at the University of Melbourne. Um, in 2018, I was fortunate enough to get involved in the Biodesign Innovation Program. And through that course, my team and I founded Ventura Medical, uh, where I'm now working full time, trying to fulfill that personal personal mission to save and transform lives through medical device development. And that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Edward, Philip, and, and Raymond. And, and look, uh, uh, each of you are obviously uh, coming from uh, um, different uh, different backgrounds. You're addressing different problems using different sides. Can we look at uh, because all you, the three ventures are really science based. Uh, science underpins what you do. Um, Edward, can we start with you and go backwards and just tell us a bit about the science that's behind the venture, behind, you know, this initiative? 
we're working or Ventura is working in neonatal respiratory care. We're working on a need uh, to improve the delivery of non-invasive respiratory support. And that was a need that we discovered through observation and interviews, um, really that clinicians had no way of knowing the actual pressure that was being delivered to, to the lungs of these neonates. Um, and so what we're doing is we're actually uh, incorporating optic fiber pressure sensor technology um, with a couple of, and leveraging off some current devices common within the NICU. Um, and these optic fiber pressure sensors have about the same diameter of a human hair. In layman's terms, they work by shining light down an optic fiber um, to a membrane. And as that membrane is moved or deformed um, by external air pressure, the light that's reflected um, changes in its intensity or phase um, or even its frequency. And this can be detected and converted into an electrical signal. And so that, that's sort of the technology space that we're working in, that optic fibers to, to measure airway pressure um, as minimally invasively as possible and really give clinicians some information to be proactive in their treatment. And then did that come out of sort of research project that you're involved in uh, personally, or you know, did you someone else make this opportunity aware to you? How uh, can you answer that question? Just tell us how how um, you came to specifically to be using this uh, technology, the science. I was part of the Biodesign Innovation Program as part of my final year studies at the University of Melbourne as part of the master's course, um, and the the key focus of the Biodesign Program is really going out and finding and verifying a clinical need and then finding solutions and verifying them accordingly. So um, my, my story is a little bit different. We didn't start with a technology. We started with a need. Um, and then we went and searched and found the research um, and, the, and the science that would, uh, that would best address that need. And that's what we're currently pursuing. Right. Thank you. And for those who are not aware, the, the biomedical, the biodesign initiative that Edward mentioned as initiative of the Department of Biomedical Engineering in the Melbourne Business School at the University of Melbourne. So I think it's been running a couple of years now. So uh, um, it's great that you took advantage of that opportunity. And obviously it's been uh, a critical factor in where you are today. Pip, can you tell us about the science behind uh, SEER Medical, please? Sure. So I guess starting at a high level, um, SEER Medical was founded about three years ago and, and not by me, although I was there for it from the start of the journey. It was founded by Dean Freestone and Mark Cook, who are also in this meeting. And it really came out of a need for um, people with epilepsy to have better long-term management solutions for their seizures, um, with a big problem being the uncertainty and unpredictability that people with epilepsy have to live with because they don't know when a seizure will strike. And one of the bottlenecks that was really causing problems with, um, with managing epilepsy was the huge amounts of data that are involved. So with, with a lot of the data coming from hospitals and from our research projects, we could see that there were, there were solutions to help make seizures more predictable. However, translating those solutions into I mean, translating that research into actual technical solutions was, was really um, stalled by a bottleneck of the, the huge amounts of data that, that are involved with um, continuously streaming sort of physiology and brain signals and um, converting that data rapidly into insights. So that's why C was founded at a high level, was to create a cloud data platform that was able to handle this volume of data and convert it into useful insights for people with epilepsy and also other key stakeholders like their, their medical providers and clinicians. Um, my research is um, sort of a, a narrower aspect of that and I'm very focused on developing seizure forecasting methods, so using um, patterns that we've discovered in people's seizures and the timing of their seizures and converting that into a gauge of when they're more or less likely to have an event in future. So a little bit like a weather forecast. But it's only by having the technology platform provided by SIA that I'm actually able to translate these research into um, a practical application. Thanks, Pip. And Ray, you're the Deputy Head of the Department of 
chemical engineering at the University of Melbourne. So there's obviously a lot of science behind, uh, you know, your venture. Can you share that with us, please? Sure. Um, by the way, the deputy head is, is really more of an administrative role. That it doesn't, it's okay. a bit disconnected from the research. It just means I get to, well, it, there's exciting things there, but it's nice not, not, not necessarily in your research group. So really what happened is my co-inventor and I, Chris, Christopher Bolton, who's on the session as well, we're actually trying to study a very different problem. We were actually interested in, in studying nanoparticle diffusion when the particle can be any shape. Uh, and in, in, this was funded as an ARC discovery grant, and it gets back to that trying to understand particle suspensions to engineer more sustainable liquid products. Um, but it was very fundamental in nature, and, and we were developing microscopy methods to track the motion of nanoparticles when we realized we desperately needed to know the size and shape of them. And the, the, the methods to understand the size and shape of, of any small particle, and while I say nanoparticle, you could easily say exosome, OMV, virus, bacteria, uh, on the kind of micron to submicron level, it's actually very difficult to see that without using something that either requires labeling, staining, drying it out, or using a very expensive microscope or some combination of that. And, and so the science that we ended up developing is what we called resonance imaging microscopy because everybody needs a name with a terrible abbreviation. But uh, we, we ended up realizing that by the methods we were using to track nanoparticle diffusion, we could instead invent a method that would actually let us get the outline um, of, of any particle down to about something maybe as small as, the, as, a, as a virus. And while it really helped where our surface diffusion work, um, we realized that it had a much broader application, particularly because we thought we could really affect how quickly you could do discovery in life sciences, where you needed to know whether or not your bacteria was there or what's happening with your outer membrane vesicle or, or, or a large number of areas where you could really supercharge that workflow in discovery, uh, where you could create a screening tool. So instead of taking a day to look at 40 samples, on a, a very bespoke instrument, maybe you could get through 400 and only need to do 40 on, on, on the uh, bespoke instrument. And then, and then the other application we saw was, it was just really good at understanding particles and powders. And we thought, well, there's a lot of use in pharmaceuticals where they really need to know the size and shape of their, their powders quickly. And, and one of the biggest challenges in process interventions and quality control and, and pharmaceutical manufacture is not knowing the size and shape. And, and depending on the size and shape, they they either have not great measurements or um, they, uh, they have to uh, wait a day or two to actually get an answer to find out whether or not what they made worked out. And we realized this ability to look at these things quickly without having to do much sample prep had a much broader scale of applications by developing the science to look at the size and shape of, of nanoscale objects. Thank you. Um, I guess it, for me, it's impressive that, that um, each of these ventures has, uh, has very much you know, science-based, and I think uh, uh, it really leads into my next question, which is to to uh, share with us. You, you, each of you were finalists in the uh, 2019 Health Tech Innovation Challenge. Um, can you tell us what that uh, what that initiative meant? You you each won some prize money, um, and more broadly, what role has the University of Melbourne played in uh, supporting your your venture? Can we start with you, Ray? Well, the, the first thing I want to remember about the Graham, Tech, Graham Clark Health Tech Challenge was just how nervous I was when I went up to speak uh, because it was, uh, I, I'd never been in, in that scenario before. And I think that might be reflective of a, a university professor um, is, is that our, our job does a lot of things, but maybe not always in, 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 in commercialization and translation. And I think for our university, the, the first big step for me was the, the translating research at Melbourne program. So similar to Edward had mentioned, biodesign was really instrumental for, for him getting started for um, uh, translating research at Melbourne, which is part of Melbourne Uni's commercialization strategy, uh, is really about training researchers about the commercialization pathway. It's, if you do the whole program, it's 36 months. Uh, and it's, it's a combination of education and support and coaching. Uh, and, and that really about engaging, understanding our market, engaging with customers. And it was that development that was critical so that we were even prepared to engage with, with Graham Clark. Uh, and then by being able to present as, as a finalist and that little bit of, 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 of support was very instrumental to us because 
that was kind of our bridging money before we got, we were successfully got an accelerating commercialization grant funded by Aus Industry. So we can try to develop an actual product for first sales by the middle of next year. And Graham Clark really helped us get along in that process. And, and then things like between Tram helping us and Graham Clark has really helped us move along to where we are today. Um, and so those university uh, programs that uh, you don't always know about and, 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 and you look at them as a professor and go, gosh, this could take a lot of time. And as it turns out, it does, but you learn an immense amount. And it, it doesn't just shape, help you through a commercialization process. It helps you shape and understand your outlook in your research in general and how you might look at research problems uh, and I'm known for being a very fundamental researcher, yet I still am, have, have a much wider view of, of how I might be able to see my discoveries be translated. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the ARC grant. Can you tell us the, the value of that grant? Uh, oh, so remember, this was an ARC discovery grant. So fundamental research, we had no intention of thinking about commercialization when we started that. Uh, and that was driven by a fundamental scientific questions. And it wasn't until um, we actually started working in those that even though we'd said, hey, we think this could be useful because, well, there's lots of ways to measure particle size, but as it turns out, doing shape quickly is, is much less common. What we probably got to was the ARC helped us discover something, and that was a great discovery and great academic outputs, but then knowing how to get from there to the commercial translation was really where um, there's a whole bunch of university systems that were helpful because TRAM was incremental and train was instrumental and critical in, in training us. And then the knowledge transfer team was instrumental in helping us with the invention disclosure and, 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 and backing in us, us enough to patent the grant. And then of course, through TRAM and, and now with undiluted funding from the AC, there's also financial support that's come through the proof of concept fund to help us in the matching money for AC. So there's, from the discovery grant, there's this entire pathway and process where we've been able to access different types of resources and support through Melbourne Uni um, that's been fantastic. And, and I think the, the, the single most amazing thing has been the generosity of people's time and their patience in helping you learn what is really a new skill set that um, you're starting out in. I guess you never uh, imagined yourself to be a, an academic entrepreneur, did you really? The, the last time we in, invented a method to, uh, that people might use, it was five other groups and we just kind of made them and mailed them to people. And we said, oh, I don't think there's really a big market here. So no, this was a, not, not the thing we, we, we thought of even three or four years ago, but it, it's certainly a, been a, an exciting pathway to, to, to go down. Thanks, Ray. That's, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you for sharing that detail with us. Pip, uh, what did the Health Tech Innovation Challenge mean for, for SEER and, and more broadly, uh, what's the relationship between SEER and, and the University of Melbourne? The project that we pitched to the Health Tech Innovation Challenge for funding was to develop a seizure gauge, as I mentioned, a device that, or a system that gives people some warning of when they're at high and low risk of having a seizure and to do that using a mobile and wearable device. Um, and the, the funds from the Health Tech Innovation Challenge went to towards purchasing um, 100 wearable smartwatches that we could use to develop this forecasting system. And really, the, the science and IP behind the, the way we were doing the forecast came out of um, university research, my own PhD research, um, and, and other, other contributions um, from university researchers and essentially what it involves is looking at long-term patterns of people's seizures and the discovery that these patterns um, tend to show uh, repeating cycles or rhythms and they're different for everyone. So that research was really fundamental in, in driving our pitch um, and, and translating it into a wearable system. And since, since sort of the year, um, since the Health Tech Innovation funding, we've purchased those devices. Um, we have got the system running in uh, just over 60 people now, I believe. Um, so it's been running for a year in the, in the earliest pe person. Um, and the results coming out are actually really, really great and exciting. And they sort of exceeded 
my expectations of what we would be able to do with the physiological signals we're recording from those wearables. Um, so we're hopefully about to publish to publish those preliminary results, but more importantly, those preliminary results formed a key part of a submission to another much larger grant. So that's the Biomed Tech Horizons grant, which is um, part of the Australian government's Medical Research Future Fund. So that was a $1 million grant awarded to SIA in partnership with the University of Melbourne. And that will really, uh, you know, take this, this wearable forecasting solution to the next level um, and, and make it much more widely available. And we've also been able to share some of our findings with, with Fitbit themselves, the manufacturer of the wearable. And I can't, sort of say too much about that yet but it's a very exciting collaboration in the works and hopefully there's some more PR around that over the next few weeks. Well obviously um, the MRFF funding is significant in anyone's yep. terms uh, and I guess a strong validation for uh, the technology and, and where you know SEA wants to go so thank you that, that, that that's wonderful news. Um, Edward what about you how did the uh, the Health Tech Innovation Challenge sort of support uh, you in the last 12 months and and, and generally the um, uh, the role the University of Melbourne has played beyond the, the bio design that you mentioned earlier. Well, that's right. Without sounding too much like a broken record, the, the bio design was our first uh, so, um, support from the University of Melbourne. So bringing together the team, um, the Masters of Engineering students and the MBA candidates to really create that multidisciplinary team, um, go out into the real world, observe clinical practice, identify needs, generate solutions, create engineering proof of concepts. All those components, um, I think, gave Ventura a really great understanding of not only the startup journey, um, but provided us with the necessary understanding of medical device startups um, and, and really understanding how we needed to focus on the need and understanding what our research questions were. Since by design, um, the University of Melbourne have continued to support us in different ways. Um, we've got a number of people on this call who we regularly uh, contact um, and for advice and, and mentorship, but also, as you mentioned, through the Graham Clark Institute um, and the Health Tech Innovation Challenge. Being a recipient of one of last year's Innovation Prize grants um, has actually enabled us to acquire a number of development kits, um, produce our own two-scale proof of concept, um, which has been fantastic. We plan to use that in an animal study later this year, which we're super excited about. Um, and I, I think having all of those things in combined, um, in combination have allowed us to, to be fairly successful in our, um, in our investment rounds that we've, that we've opened and, uh, and will soon close. Thank you. And, and, and I guess starting with you now, Edward, um, technology is great, having the technology and having, you know, the research to back it up uh, is, is a starting point, but tell me about your sort of pathway to customers. How, what's your strategy for getting Ventura, you know, uh, getting customers to pay for your uh, uh, products uh, uh, when they're available? Yeah, great question. Who are your customers? <laughs> great question. And one, a number of our investors uh, love to ask. So uh, we are still an early stage company, uh, you, could, you could call us. And so we've got a long journey ahead of us. Um, but our customers will be hospitals with NICUs, neonatal intensive care units. Um, we'll be selling directly to them our products. We've got both a consumable um, and a, uh, a monitor component. Um, and we're looking at different ways that we can package that, whether or not it's a licensing agreement for the monitor or whether or not it's uh, an upfront fee. There's a number of things that we're exploring in terms of um, how and how best to actually uh, get our products used in hospital, um, but but that's where we're looking at the moment. Um, and we, we've started to develop some of those relationships um, with, with NICUs within Melbourne um, and around Australia. Thank you. Ray, are you next week, you know, given the, the wide applications of your technology, have you thought about, um, you know, your customer base? Uh, who might you oh, uh, target initially? Very much so. Um, well, so uh, with the uh, the AC grant, which is through through Melbourne Uni, though we've the whole goal there is to develop um, customer ready products by about the middle of next year. We formed Tiny Bright Things, which is the company in which we're selling our Halo element, which is the product. It's a combination of hardware and software that 
can pretty much transform any standard microscope to look at, at the uh, nanoscale imaging system. And, and we kind of have two sectors that, that we're targeting there. One is, is in life sciences where um, it's pretty obvious that it, you, you can look at microscopy users anywhere in life sciences and biotech and, and, and see some very obvious good fits uh, with customers. Uh, which makes us is, is one of the things we're doing in the, the AC grant is really looking for people that are interested in trialing these devices in their labs to, to try our, our halo element on your microscope and let us know where it works and where it doesn't work and see how well it works for, for your particular biological imaging need. Uh, and, and so that's, that's in the life sciences sector and, and R&D in general. That's, that's one of the, our, our customers and user bases. And then the other one is, 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 which may even be a larger market, is industrial powder uh, processing and manufacture. And uh, certainly one of the, the leading industries in there is, is, is pharmaceutical, where they want to know the size and shape of a lot of the powders they make. Um, but that's also in um, ag science as well. They have very similar problems, just different materials that they need to look at. And, uh, and, and we're in Australia, and well, not quite as relevant to Graham Clark, also in minerals processing, because knowing the size and shape of tiny rocks, by the way, they don't normally call them rocks, uh, is, is, is very I I critical, again, in those steps about processing and refining and purifying. And, and so that's kind of, we have an, uh, an industrial sector and an R&D sector, uh, and, and certainly trials, it's much easier to work with an R&D sector and trials and trialing things out, but we're also looking for trying to roll out trials and on-site trials with industrial, potential industrial partners. And we've had some interest, uh, particularly in the, in the pharma area about trying out these devices on site. Um, and COVID slowed us down a little, but uh, we're, we're still trying to get our prototypes together and, and be ready. So by the time we're able to actually go on site, we have our, 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 our uh, pseudo commercial ready prototypes ready to trial in those areas. Thank you. Uh, and Pip, uh, I guess C is a little different because it's been around um, for a little while uh, at the moment compared to to the other two ventures that we're discussing. Um, so can you share with us, tell us how, you know, your customers are really, I guess, patients, but but C has um, introduced a, a, a quite a, a new uh, business model for uh, uh, for treatment. Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, so you sort of hit the nail on the head that Sierra is definitely has provided a distribution network um, for this new technology. And that is that's because in addition to being very active in um, research and development, Sierra um, has a functional and profitable business model, which is in running epilepsy diagnostic monitoring in clinics across Australia. And I believe there's there's now well over 20 clinics around Australia and in, in capitals and remote locations. Um, and it's been quite remarkable growth because there's just such a need for this diagnostic testing. Um, and it's there's quite a few accessibility um, problems for people to actually access this testing. Mm -hmm. So the growth has really been pretty phenomenal over the three years. And then from our perspective, what that unlocks is basically an fantastic distribution network and pathway to our customers who are people with epilepsy. They're the people we exist to help. Um, but there's also direct uh, interaction with other stakeholders, which include epilepsy advocacy groups, so the epilepsy foundations in Australia and internationally, and the um, drug companies and sort of therapeutic device companies are very interested in the idea of using forecasts to improve the efficacy of their medication um, and their devices. So that's an important sort of stakeholder as well that we also um, have, have networks involving those other. And I think, as I understand it, the, the disruptive thing about SEER really is the fact that, uh, you know, previously patients would have to uh, um, come to a, a hospital and, you know, be monitored over a, you know, eight or 10 or 12 hour period, I guess. So that no longer is necessary. So it takes some pressure, if you like, off the, the hospital system, freeing up beds for, for other uh, patients. Um, but the fact that, again, it can be done within the individual's uh, own, you know, environment, 
um, and you extend the period over which you can monitor. So therefore you get hopefully more accurate uh, or more meaningful readings, right? Yeah, that's right. So traditionally this test has been done in hospital um, and because of the limitations on hospital beds, there's long wait lists. And SIA now has the equivalent of over a 100 bed hospital, which is certainly the largest epilepsy diagnostic unit in Australia, if not globally. That's amazing. That's, that, that's great news. I think uh, seamedical.com if people want to learn more about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, Ray, you mentioned uh, uh, COVID-19 and, and, and the pandemic. Uh, and I guess for each of you, uh, it's just um, a question. Has, has the pandemic impacted the venture in any way? I mean, has it, is there any upside? Uh, what's been the downside? Uh, can, you, can, you, can we start with you, Pip, just to give us a share with us what impact you know, the last six months has had on, on the operations of SEER and, and how you've met those challenges? Yeah, sure. It's um, been a hugely challenging time for everyone, of course, um, especially for new ventures that are out there trying to raise capital and get started. And, you know, as, um, at, at SEER, for instance, um, we, we had basically got hit with a massive shock of people who were um, cancelling appointments um, in droves due to, you know, Fear, fear of coming in and just fear of what was going on and how we would manage manage um, protocols. Uh, so yeah, it was just a really, really disruptive time. Um, it's been challenging for all of the employees, especially for a company that had gone through um, such a rapid growth phase, I think from starting three years ago to around 130 employees today. Um, so obviously supporting that kind of growth is um, financially challenging and definitely the lockdown had an impact on that. Um, from this, from the research perspective, um, it, it made it, we were challenged in recruiting people to, to trial and test out our wearable seizure forecasting project. Um, all of re all recruitment suddenly had to be done remotely. We were doing mail outs and calling people and talking them through it instead of accessing them in clinics and in person. So that slowed things down. I guess um, the silver lining has been that fortunately our technology and our research is based on cloud computing, wearable devices, um, digital health and all of these things we're able to deliver to people remotely in their own home um, and, and via, you know, web browser. So I think, you know, with the, with the, with the lockdown, um, the acceptance of this kind of remote health monitoring is definitely um, going to be expedited and that will in the long run help. To talk yeah, to obviously about. you're in the, uh, you're in the people contact business as it were um and uh, clearly uh, many uh, you know re restrictions beyond your control uh, have obviously severely impacted uh, the business and and hopefully i guess for all our sake that uh, um, we get back to normal very soon um ray how has COVID impacted uh, you and your your endeavors so far I mean, we're, we're a very early stage company. I mean, we have an MVP, but we're basically trying to develop our, our, our commercial product. And, and so uh, it slowed down some of those development steps, but um, it's certainly getting into other people's labs and, uh, and, and trialing it is, is, is a, a bit of a, a challenge now. But um, uh, it's given us time to, to iterate a bit more on design. And, and, and fortunately, though, since we're all used to Zoom meetings, um, customers are happy to chat to you over Zoom. Uh, perhaps it's, it's even a little bit, they're, they're looking forward to that type of connection a little bit more than, than they, they might have been bef before the lockdown. So I guess the, in the engagement side, it's, it's, it's been going well, but then just uh, looking to get to the point of, um, of trials in other people's labs is, 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 is slowing down a little bit. But uh, uh, it's nice to take that pause. And the more times you can talk to people before you go to build something and and really make sure you're integrating for, for their needs, the better. So are you on target to meet your deadline for a prototype uh, 
I think you mentioned, is it mid next year or May next year? Yeah, mid next year. Um, I'm going to optimistically say we think so uh, and realistically think, yeah, actually, I think so. Um, but uh, certainly it, 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 there's been some musical chairs in our planning, but um, we sales, we had in some of our planning, we'd kind of consciously knew that we needed to plan for uh, at least an initial lockdown. It's the second one that's probably thrown us, uh, thrown uh, a bit more of a spanner in the works than the first one. But uh, um, so far, yes. so good. Um, um, and if people want to learn more about Tiny, um, your website rather, can you give us the, the web address? Uh, it's just one word, tinybrightthings.com. Tiny uh, Thank you. Free plug. Um, uh, Edward, um, like, uh, like the others, how, uh, uh, what impact has the uh, uh, pandemic had on, on your efforts to, you know, move the venture forward? Yeah, a bit similar to Ray. Uh, Ventura has been quite fortunate in our unique placement to sort of ride out the impact of the pandemic um, thus far. We've been able to transition to work from home fairly seamlessly, um, being a startup, um, and we've been able to remain fairly agile, make changes to the way that we communicate and operate where necessary. Um, we've had a, a couple of small delays uh, to things like our animal study, um, but we're now hoping to be able to complete that towards the end of this year. Um, otherwise, we've been able to manage to stick to most of our timelines, which we're actually really proud of. Um, what the pandemic has sort of shown is just how delicate the human respiratory system is and just how invasive mechanical ventilation is. Um, and so in some ways, that's really helped us uh, communicate our value proposition to some of our stakeholders. Mm, great. Looking to the future, if you looking two, three years uh, into the future, I guess that's probably about as far as anyone can look uh, these days. Um, what do you hope to achieve in that time? What, what, what are some of the goals you're setting yourself for the next two or three years? Yeah, two, two to three years is an eternity for, for a startup. Um, but we do have our eyes set up on some fairly aggressive targets. Um, by 2022, we sort of want to be finishing our clinical trials, uh, be well on our way to getting our regulatory approval um, for our device in Australia, New Zealand, and even the US. Um, and we're aiming for a commercial launch in Australia within the next three years. So depending on uh, a number of factors, that, that's, that's our target. Um, we've, we've been able to hit all of our targets thus far and looking forward to being able to do that in the COVID normal as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Pip, what about you? Where do you, uh, I guess uh, in general, uh, uh, you may not, uh, be privy to uh, you know the seer sort of strategy, but 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 generally, uh, from what you know, um, where where will seer hope to be in in a few years time? Um, well, looking at looking at the growth over the past three years, I, I don't think it's too ambitious to say um, that we we'll, would like to see the seizure forecasting solution rolled out to hundreds of thousands of people with epilepsy globally. Um, we certainly have strong partnerships in the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, in addition to diagnostic testing, shifting to the home as, as the standard in, in at least at Australia, the US and Europe, we would also like to have seizure forecasting available. Let's hope it, let's hope that uh, it, it comes to reality. Um, look, um, each of you have, have, you know, been in a, um, You've come from a university and still are, uh, in Ray's case, in a university research environment. But, but what advice would you give researchers thinking about, you know, how they might use their research to, uh, to uh, take it to start a technology venture? People, from your own experience, what advice would you give uh, someone who's in a lab working away on some really good science that they think, you know, someone else might uh, benefit by, uh, by uh, using this technology? Um, yeah, so, so I'm in a slightly different position to the other two panellists as not being the founder myself. Uh, however, I was there from the start of the journey um, with Dean and it was it's certainly um, a challenging ride and, um, yeah, it's definitely been inspirational to be a part of and see all the work that, that's gone into it and paying, starting to pay off. But I guess the advice I would give to other researchers who think they have a great idea and see a need is that it's definitely possible. Um, you just need a lot of determination and confidence to see it through. But 
um, if, if you're willing to take the chance. Um, it's just been astounding what's possible. And the other sort of big lesson for me in clinical startup ventures is working early and continuously with clinical stakeholders is absolutely critical um, for me just being able to cross over the, the biomedical engineering, the clinical and the industry sort of trifecta has been vital to success. Thanks, Pip. Edward, what about you? What yeah, advice would I, you give someone uh, sort of following behind in your footsteps? I, I echo a lot of Pip's points. I think, um, I think her, her statement that uh, to be able to connect with clinical uh, or clinicians is really important as early as you can and continuously. Um, my, my advice would be to go for it. Australia's got such a, a rich and, uh, and fantastic research um, environment and we all benefit when that um, amazing research uh, can be applied um, in, in healthcare and, and many other fields of science. Um, yeah, that, that would be my, my advice. As Pip said, it, it's uh, a difficult journey, but a really rewarding one. Um, and if, if you think you've got something in, in your research, which can uh, help people. Um, yeah, go for it. Ray, what about you? You got, you might have, obviously do have people in your lab who, you know, might be coming up to you now and saying, Hey, um, I like what you're doing. Um, what advice would you give them? I, I think it depends on, 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 on where you are, you know, an academic, as an academic, my perspective is a, a little bit different um, where I, I do actually echo what, what the others have said. I think as an academic, there's so many things pulling on your time and you think, well, should you invest in this? Um, and you also remembering that one in 10 are really successful as an actual sta startup company or, or venture. Um, but to me, those aren't reasons not to do it. Um, I think uh, as you go through this, it's, a it's, a, it's, it's quite a process. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of chances to learn. And, and probably being, as, as you go through and learn about that process, figuring out where you fit in it. An academic may realize that there is probably a point where maybe you think you are better um, doing a discovery in a lab uh, and maybe not going through the entire process or maybe handing off the discovery to someone else at some point. But uh, even if you were to do that, you still need to understand, it's still such a, a useful experience to go through and ask yourself, how this could translate and engaging with end users. Now, um, since I'm thinking more pharmaceutical industry than, than necessarily clinicians, I, I do think the, the learning experience that engaging with an end user can be transformational in how you do any of your future research, whether or not you're gonna go back to being a fundamental researcher in a lab or, 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 or jump on and, and, and follow a, a startup path. Um, and certainly, yes, it's, it, it's challenging, but to be honest, um, our jobs are always challenging. We're always busy, and and I think it's, it's 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 a bit more inspiring and a bit more exciting to uh, to look at, at at commercialization pathways as one of the things that you might decide you're going to spend your busy time on and and be busy with. Thank you. And look, a closing comment from each of you, uh, starting with you, Ray. Um, what have you valued most about uh, you know your journey so far? I'm going to say probably the the perspective I've learned on research in general, how it might affect even future discoveries uh, and um, the ability to, the number of different people I've been able to meet from different backgrounds and different areas. And, um, and I'm still amazed the, the generosity people have in, in sharing their time or insight and experience when you're trying to learn about this process. Thank you, Edward. The thing that I've probably valued most has been the opportunity to meet and network with people just like Pip and Ray, um, who have a deep passion for their work and who are transforming the face of their fields. Um, their stories, many others, uh, inspire you to do better as well. Um, and I'm sure they'll both make huge differences in the way we're living in the future. So that, that's been probably the most enjoyable part, just the people that you get to, uh, to engage with on this journey um, and, and work with along the way. It is a people business too, isn't it? Uh, wherever, whichever, wherever you look, you need uh, people to uh, interact with, support you, whether it's mentors or people with funding or pieces of equipment that you may need. Uh, uh, it's all about, uh, it's all about uh, relationships with people. And Pip, from you finally, what, what, what have you 
valued most about uh, your journey? Yeah, so mine is people focused as well. I think from working alongside industry, it's realizing how much a team, a large team of people can achieve and how quickly they can develop solutions and innovations as opposed to coming from my PhD research, which was, you know, within a lab, but largely individual. And now, you know, it's me and my PhD student working individually on our research. And when you, when you take that into a large team environment, large team of um, software developers and data scientists, it's just really redoubled my passion for research to see how quickly they can translate things into solutions and technologies. At the moment, there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, discussion about, uh, um, you know, uh, STEM, for example. I, want to, I just want to focus on, on STEM, looking at the sort of future pipeline of, uh, you know, engineers, people with uh, engineers and technology uh, skills. Uh, do you have a view at the moment about, you know, um, the future environment for, uh, 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 for uh, university students, uh, those with, with some uh, STEM background? Um, you've all come from that area yourselves. Um, what, uh, do you have a view about, you know, the current environment? Are we, are we, um, are we doing enough to support uh, STEM students? It's a bit of a hot potato with the recent funding to universities, trying to answer that question. Yeah, yeah, it is, I know. Um, but, but again, it's really important that we do have a, uh, clearly a, a workforce. If, if we're going to create uh, the industries, we, we, do need to, uh, uh, we do need graduates coming out of our uh, tertiary sector to, you know, to take on those um, positions. I, I guess, uh, Pip, in Sears' case, you mentioned you know a large number of of uh, employees. Um, are they? Can you tell us a bit about their sort of uh, skills and qualifications? Are they are they all engineers or are they people with marketing and other skills? Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely a lot of diverse backgrounds of people working at CR. Um, actually, it's probably a good. Um, opportunity to say a lot of the employees of CR have come from the University of Melbourne so I think yeah. that's a pretty good um, endorsement of, of mm -hmm. how the university is training people up and really I'd kind of like to do a shout out to the program that Edward was coming from which is the um, biodesign and innovation class and to the efforts of David Graydon in particular yep. in biomedical engineering I think that's I don't know how many, but it spun out a lot of companies from that program. So I think yes. whatever they're doing, it's something definitely right there. Uh, and Professor Kwang Hui Lim from the uh, Melbourne Business School, of course, uh, uh, it's a joint initiative. Uh, if people want to learn more about that, biodesignmelbourne.com. Uh, and I think, I believe that initiative is, is continuing and, and it's been a great feeder uh, for other initiatives like MedTech, Actuator Program, which is a national uh, program supporting the development of Australia's medical technology uh, sector. So it's, it's great to hear uh, that the university has been a great feeder for, uh, uh, for CIA itself. We have um, a joke in amongst employees of CIA, we ask new employees what their David Graydon index is, because a large number of them are ex-PhD students. Right, okay. AME students. Um, there you go. Um, another plug for Professor David Graham, who's doing a great job in, in uh, um, you know, making that initiative uh, start to have real impact, which is really, uh, again, amazing, and a contribution that our universities are making. It's not just the University of Melbourne, there are other universities around Victoria and around the country that are all very actively, you know, supporting uh, innovation, um, research, uh, and looking to... Uh, to have a greater impact uh, uh, in the community. Thank you, Pip, um, Ray, and Edward for uh, sharing your story. I think uh, what's impressed me is uh, obviously your, your personal dedication. Um, I think it, it bodes well for, for Australia as a, as a country that we have, you know, people like you and many, many others like you who, uh, who are seeing the opportunity of, you know, using their, their research and their knowledge to 
to go and create wealth. At the end of the day, we want uh, uh, knowledge-based uh, jobs, industries of the future. So uh, what you're doing is really um, an important part of creating that uh, reality. We, we, we talk about how good our research is and we talk about we want to create new industries. And thankfully, there is, a, I think, a realisation. Universities are increasingly supportive in many ways, as we've heard from each of you. Um, federal and state governments are supportive. There are a number of initiatives that have come out of the Medical Research Future Fund. Um, and um, biomedical engineering, medical technologies uh, is a key sector that's uh, accepted as uh, an important uh, guide to our, uh, to our future. So um, I'm pretty heartened by, by what each of you are doing and, and I'm grateful that you've shared your story today. Uh, thank you, Pip, Ray, Edward. Uh, good luck with uh, the journey ahead. Uh, we'll keep an eye on what you're doing and how you're going. Thank you for uh, allowing me to host this event. Uh, until next time, please be healthy and be safe. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.